Methinks we are, in fact, recording. Let us hope so. Good evening, Jim. Good evening, Brant. We say evening, and yet we have no idea when anybody is watching this. So, uh, you know, we'll hope for the best. Um, we have 100 pages of Dragon issue number 78 to work ourselves through here. And, and our challenge is to try to do so in as close to an hour as possible um, for two reasons. One, I have a feeling that hour and 40-minute episodes may be taxing the audience's patience. Um, but, but also, I get a lot of sleep last night, and I'd rather not fall asleep in the middle of recording this episode. So, Good deal. <laughs> I like to try and get this done and crawl my ass into bed. <laughs> deal. But we had to get it recorded... Tonight, or uh, we might not have had a chance to this coming week. So, uh, so here we go. Dragon number seventy-eight. You want to take a gander as to when this might have been released? Uh, summer of eighty-three. You're pretty close. This is this is October of eighty-three. Oh, oh, swinging a miss. So, well, we did seventy-three not too long ago, and that was early eighty-three. And so, yes, right, right, this, right, right, right. right. This issue number is fairly close to one that we have previously knocked out, uh, but it needed to be not not that it needed to be the the article I wanted or the articles in question I wanted to bring up for us tonight um, happen to have relative current events ties to what's going on right now, and uh, so so with that teaser we we hope to keep the audience around for a little bit. Um, it just so happened that this was an eighty three release uh, when this well ready came out. Re well. Number one song, October of, uh, matter of fact, this week, October, October 23rd, 1983. <sighs> All right, well, I was off on Say, Say, Say earlier when, uh, when we went over this. 83, late 83. Uh, Bonnie Tyler, Total Eclipse of the Heart. Shot in a goal. That's Seriously? A, Holy it crap. is. Dude, I was totally winging that. <laughs> I knew that was an 83 song. I didn't realize it was that late in the year. That that was... It, it, <laughs> that's awesome. That Gretzky shoots and scores. All right, can he get the but, pair? What was the number... Now, again, we want to do this a little bit differently. What was the number one movie released in this month? Not necessarily the best movie of the year of yeah, 1983, yeah. but the number one movie released in October of 1983. All right, so Return of the Jedi was earlier in the summer, and I don't know that it would have held on that long as the number one movie of the year. Or the number, but again, not, it, of the it, year. Have been, it was not you're, released in October. You're right, yeah. The the number one, it, it wasn't the October... I don't think it was still number... So wait, you want the movie that was released in October? You want the movie that was number one in the month of October? The movie that was released in October. Oh, geez. Uh, what was the big release? I was already in Germany at the time. Um, Hang on. Uh, Mr. Mom was already out by then. Jedi was well out by then. Um, Probably a Dirty Harry movie. Um, uh, Temple of Doom was 84, so it wasn't that yet. Um, I don't know, whatever Dirty Harry movie came out that year. Was not. It okay. was, in fact, The Right Stuff. Oh, okay. Saw that one. Good um, show. Yeah, <laughs> back when movies were long enough that they needed intermissions. Um. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so... Yeah, um, not a bad flick. Uh, a guy named Shepard playing a guy named Glenn. Um, right. And, and a guy named Glenn playing a guy named Shepard. So that was fun. Um, all right, well, I, uh, I got lucky on the, on the song, so we'll, we'll take that. Um, all right, so uh, ElfQuest minis. Here is a sure. question. Did you ever sure. read ElfQuest? Uh, I did not. Uh, I'm, I well, no, that's not that's not true. I've read a couple of the comic books. Yes. Um, my wife, actually, and my sister-in-law are very, very big fans of the Elf Quest. I, I will say, all things equal, coming from our friends at Ralph Partha, these are some nice figs, and they're fairly close to the actual characters. I was a fan of the original series of the comics, um, and the original Elf Quest role-playing game 
wasn't bad. Quite frankly, it didn't need its own game, but nobody had figured out how to license media properties into another game quite yet in an right. intelligent way. Um, so instead of simply like licensing an ElfQuest campaign for uh, for for D and D or RuneQuest or GURPS or whatever, they they built their own game, which was a little unnecessary. It would have been easy enough to to house rule together the the couple of specific powers that exist in ElfQuest, like you know recognition and such. But um, it was uh, it was a fun little series to read. Um, I- interesting trivia bit on ElfQuest. Wendy and Richard Keeney actually make an appearance in, I want to say it's an issue of Ghost Rider, um, some early 80s Marvel comic. Um, they show up as just like, they're, they're essentially extras in the comic. They're just a couple that's kind of in the background in one of the scenes somewhere. Um, but they're, they're mentioned by name. Hey, I want you to meet my friends. And uh, I want to say they're dressed up in like fencing gear or something. But, but they show up in some stray issue essentially as extras in a comic book. So, um, and look, an ice ad that's not Rollmaster on page two there. <laughs> um, they're going for Merp instead. Um, uh, it's interesting. You know, it, Go we, ahead. We've been down on them a little bit, but I do want to say you'll notice the Middle Earth series, Middle Earth poster map for five yeah. American dollars. I cert, I, I believe I bought two of them over the years. <laughs> they were quite, they were quite nice. I, I was going to say, I, I, I wasn't going to get down on ice on this one. My brother, I got a, I got a brother who's about four and a half years younger than me, and uh, never really got bit by the gaming bug. He would, uh, he would play some, some you know, old school Atari stuff with me every now and then, uh, but he, he rarely sat down and played any war games with me and dad. He would almost never touch a role playing game, um, <clears throat> but he had read the Tolkien books. At a fairly young age, I think he actually finished the series before I did. I read the first one, and it was several years before I got back around to reading two and three. Um, he, he read them all fairly young, and so in the hopes of, of kindling his gamerness, I did buy him the uh, the original base rule book, the original base Merp rule book, um, somewhere along the way. And he, uh, he read it, kind of got into it, created a couple of characters, um, sort of noodled around with he he actually jammed it with me as the the player um going through a basic little adventure didn't really mess with it much after that but it was enough that a kid who was a Tolkien fan but not a role player was able to pick up the Merp book and run with it and create characters put together a rudimentary adventure and actually run through it for his big brother which was kind of nifty cool yeah um, all right, so our masthead layout geek alert. Hey, look, we still can't figure out transparencies on contents up there. Um, uh, Kim Mohan has taken over as our editor in chief over here. Ed Greenwood is a contributing editor. The national advertising representative gets his own typography because we hadn't figured out how to deal with fonts just yet. Um, and Larry Elmore is a contributing artist, he doesn't yet own the covers. Um, but we've got uh, we're doing mind games. We're dealing with psionics. Uh, and let's scroll ourselves down here a little bit. Where's our cover info? You were asking about what our critter on our cover is. I was. Looking, I, was. I was indeed. I was looking for our cover info. Where the hell is it? Maybe it's on the other page. Maybe it's not. Maybe it doesn't exist. Oh my goodness, we don't have the cover info. Sorry, dude. I'm left to wonder. Yes, we, we all are. That's quite annoying. They're usually pretty good about mentioning the cover info in there. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's skip through a couple of these things to actually get to real articles. Uh, let's see. You um, here you go. Strategist Club Awards. Yes. Seven games and game products at the eighty-three Strategist Club Club Awards, um, and. Uh, the awards announced at the Strategist Club Banquet. Were you at Gen Con 16, or were you still a bit young for that one? Uh, as as I believe I said when we went over this particular year in, in an earlier episode, this is my first Gen Con. Okay. Uh, Outstanding board game was an ASL game. GI Anvil of Victory. Outstanding RPG was Star Frontiers. 
uh, a game I'm still not sure has ever truly gotten its due. I think Star Frontiers always suffers in the shadow of Traveler um, as being an old sci-fi role-playing game, uh, but still a very playable game. Um, what else we got here? Uh, outstanding gameplay aid champions to Minis Rules, Striker, right? The Traveler Minis Rules. Yeah, Striker is a great system. And uh, who'd have thunk the outstanding professional magazine was Dragon? <laughs> <laughs> One yes. wonders if the outstanding professional magazine had been Space Gamer Fantasy Gamer, if they would have just accidentally forgotten to mention that one in here, you know. Oh, whoops, we ran out of space before we could include that in the layout. So, uh, the James Bond role-playing game. Again, fabulous idea, virtually unplayable. Did, did you ever give the game itself a whirl? And if so, how far did you actually get into it? I, I, I did not play it. I read the rule book straight through. I was a top secret guy. I love top secret. I played a lot of top secret. I This is one that I would love to just chat with the people that created this game just to see what the history was. Because obviously there is a relationship between Avalon, Avalon Hill and Victory Games um, to see what the impulse was to try to take on the guys over at TSR. But that's the other thing that fascinates me about this. We're still clearly in the day when Dragon is not a house organ. Yes. Because this is not, this is, you know, this is a direct competitor to their own, their own, uh, their own product. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, certainly not what you would have ever seen in the general magazine. Uh, but I think Dragon still thought of themselves as the magazine of the entire hobby. And at this time, the hobby was hardly... It, it wasn't just unified across publishers. I mean, we're seeing war game... You know, Outstanding Board Game was a war game. We're seeing war games hand-in-hand -hand with role-playing stuff uh, throughout the magazine still. Um, much like I suspect the audience was. Um, I, I know I played war games and role-playing stuff pretty equally at the time. Um I will say the biggest challenge, and we've mentioned it before, so we'll just touch on it and keep going, but one of the biggest challenges of the James Bond role-playing game is the whole point is everybody wants to be James Bond, but if you've got a group of, like, five people, who the hell gets to be James Bond? And you well, can't all be James well, Bond. I mean, it's not like The Walking but, Dead yeah. where we're all Negan, you know? <laughs> and, and, the other, and none of the stories are built around a party. Mm -hmm. there, it's, James, it's James Bond and everybody that gets shot. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. You know, it's very. It's very much like trying to have a. Uh, I, I've said for years now that Sean Bean, in all the deaths he's suffering in various fictional universes, is having car his karmic debt repaid for the Sharp series. Yeah. <laughs> in which he lives and everybody else dies. Yeah. And there's nothing more undesirable that I can think of, all with the exception, I suppose, of Patrick. But, you know, with everybody else dying around you, who wants to be that guy? Yeah. Like you say, everybody wants to be Bond. Well, and, and the only other person that doesn't die is the girl he ends up in bed with at the end of the movie. And At the end. Yeah. And, and who really wants to play... Earlier... I was going to say, who really wants to play that, that person? You know, who wants right. that character? Where again, you know what's coming. Too early, otherwise you're in trouble. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, psionics in the AD and D world. Now I don't know what your opinion on psionics was. I my whole issue with psionics was always essentially it felt like just a different magic system. It always felt like just another way to cast spells, and why do we need to invent an entire wholly separate universe of ways to cast spells we've already got regular old wizard magic user types we've got the divine magic of the clerics out there why do we need a completely separate set of psionic abilities out there just so that we can give some paladin the ability to you know to to ego blast somebody why wasn't this just a regular old magic system <laughs> what what was what, I mean, what I, was your opinion of psionics what was your experience with it um, I had almost no characters ever. I had one party, and this would probably have been in college. 
I had one party where I had one guy that wanted to use psionics. Other than that, everybody gave it a broad, broad pass. Yeah. And I think there, it, it's actually well stated in this article as you cruise through it. The biggest problem is they're just put in there with any, without any sort of explanation as to what it is or what it, you know, where they're from. Yeah. And that's what and it, it talks so about right here. Power from the mind. First problem is that its origin is not explained. <laughs> Yeah, and so when you do that, and and the other thing is, let's face it, why do we pl play d and I suppose there's a lot of different reasons, but one of the biggest ones is we can live out the stories we read. Yes. How many psionic characters do you know? Well, funny you should ask, because we're going to get to that here in a page or two. <laughs> um, so, so we will get there shortly, and I will answer that question. I, I will defer answering for a moment. Um, but... But you're right. I mean, that that's one of those key things is that we are looking at how do we, you know, we, we want to play those characters that, that we've read. That's why, you know, one out of every five D&D &D players in the late 70s, early 80s wanted to carry a halfling named Frodo. Um, you know, we, we get that. The To me, the biggest thing was this was an attempt to take something out of literature and put it into the D&D &D game. However... We're grafting it over top of existing tools that are already there, like the the Jack Vance magic, um, that the psionics come from a wholly different body of literature. And now what? You know, um, it is nice that these guys admit they're not for everyone. <laughs> Thanks there. Um, but but it's it's interesting. They're describing them as being not for everyone. Uh, in that not everybody gets to be psionic, not, hey, a lot of people just generally don't like playing with psionics. Um, I, I always, so I never played any of the games, but I did read copies of Psy World. Um, the, uh, to me, that was an appropriate way to slap them into the game. Because at that point... The Psy World rules and system, that's it. Like, that's what passes for magic in that game, is, is the psionics there. It's not a completely separate and, in some cases, duplicative magic system. Um, we'll, we'll move on here a little bit. And so, who can have psionics? Any characters of any class can have psionic powers. And so that's, you know, that right there is a problem. You've essentially got... You know, fighters, paladins, monks running around that have what amounts to magic. And to talk about skewing some game balance there. Um, all right, we'll cue Jim rant here on, I was just told this was a finely balanced game. <laughs> right. Right, we got lied to a couple episodes ago. Yeah. Where we were told how delicately balanced all this is. And look... Go your own way, okay? Play your own game, enjoy your own game. But D&D &D is a class-based system for a reason. Yeah. It was built that way, it was structured that way, and, and now we've gone away from that because people want to do whatever they want to do, and I understand, that's fine. But it's always been a class-based system. My D&D &D will always be class-based, and it'll always have that interaction between race and class, strengths, limitations. That's part of the story. And when you lose that in the interest of letting everybody do everything, you're not playing the same game. Yeah, yeah. And I think you're absolutely right that suddenly saying this ridiculously armored paladin guy can shoot the brain out of his orc opponent, I don't, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what that game looks like. Well, it's certainly nothing I want to play. If you do, well, enjoy yourself. I'm not knocking it. I just, you know, and, and we do go through, for the exact reasons you state, we do go through this drama, as you read through here, of needing the blessing of those on high to release certain races and certain classes to be able to use psionics. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, I'll tell you what you're playing. At that point, you're playing RuneQuest, right? I mean. Sure. 
you know, where it's it's completely skill based or uh, you know, Dragon Quest or something. You know, it's <laughs> there's there's plenty of other games where that happens. Um, and so this whole idea of w what I always found entertaining is the uh, the the arbiters of D and D. Uh, led by by the inestimable Gary Gygax, were always absolutely you know this is this is a Vancey and Magic system spell points need not apply, and yet what do we have on psionics? We have spell excuse me not spell points they're psionic points that allow us to uh, to to ramp up and down in our psionic attack ability. Um, the uh, so we're we're gonna move on with the psionics here real quick, but I do. How uh, how much of the Lost Worlds game books did you ever play with? Since we have that ad on screen right here. Oh my goodness! Uh, this horribly have... contrasted ad. This this you know, lost in the paste up sort of ad. But yeah, good. well it's funny because as you scroll down it, I realized you wouldn't have experienced that way originally. But as I scrolled down it, I thought this was a psionic orc on my right. <laughs> um, I, I played the devil out of their Ace of Aces game, yeah. where they took the same basic system and applied it to World War One air combat. Um, but these, my goodness, I think I probably had six of them, and and they were they were always a very convenient thing to take with you, yeah. Especially if you knew you were going to be on a a plane flight or a, a train trip or something like that. In a day, kids, before there was such a thing as your Nintendo. Yeah, or before you even had a phone, that you could take with you. They are reasonably portable, fun entertainment, good stuff. Uh, of interest uh, for me, they are they are much more of academic interest than anything else. So you know, I've I've done a variety of academia here and there, and on occasion, uh, somebody has screwed up and let me discuss game design in front of students. Um, I, actually, you know, I would love to do a lot more of the of that, but but it's tough to find those jobs, and. Uh, and one of the things that, that I would always beat a drum on is it doesn't matter what kind of game you are designing. What is your paper prototype? Show me your paper prototype so that we can work through how this thing is supposed to work before you ever start writing a line of code, before you ever start designing playing pieces, before you ever start, you know, Photoshopping a map together, whatever it is, show me your paper prototype of how this thing is supposed to work. And I actually had some kid in class one day said, well, how do you make a paper prototype of a first-person shooter? And I said, I'll show you next week. And I came back and I threw a Lost Worlds book at him. Um, because nice. that's what this is. This is your paper prototype of a first-person shooter. And uh, Sure. And, and so the, the, some of the dumb questions stopped after that. That was, that, was, that was one of those, you know, moments that teachers always can't wait to have. One of those, I really, you know, stuck into that smart-ass kind of moments. Um, you don't get them often, so you tend to revel in them when they happen. So, um, all right. So this is this is some more on our on our psionics, and uh, so here's Baldwin Bandersnatch. Um, go ahead, Snicker. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you know, you know, we're talking. It's it's uh, it, there's there's still these tight. It's interesting too because we're going to see as we go through these episodes. The, the ties to the literature that creates so much of this yes. uh, become more and more tenuous. And D&D &D starts to refer to its own literature and its own references. But this is still, yeah, you, you know where you came from, and that's cool. Yeah. Um, funny you should mention where it came from, because um, we're, we're getting there. So we're still on kind of the science, and we're not going to go through the entire article here and sort of tear it apart bit by bit, because uh, that's not what we're after. We're after sort of the whole nostalgia trip here. Um, and... and Honestly, we're skipping past some of these ads as well because we've discussed some of these ads before, like the Companions ad we've talked about before here a little bit. The Fantasy Takes Flight we've talked about before. Um, so we're, we're going to bounce our way through this a little quicker. Um, let me get past our... So here we go. Sage Advice is Sonic info here. Uh, if a non-Sonic character has his intelligent wisdom or charisma increased by powerful magics, would it give you a chance to become Sonic? Well... Is, are there psionics in your campaign? If the answer is no, then this is still going to be no, right? <laughs> you know. Okay. And, and the only thing I care about in that entire response is the second sentence. <laughs> a wish a wish bell properly worded. <laughs> there I, you go. I 
my, my son and I have spent long hours, hours, literally, going back and forth about wishes and about why you should never make them or why you should never be involved in them. And, and the ways that a genie, a malevolent creature, or anyone else granting a wish can job over someone making a wish. So uh, I, I'm delighted by properly worded. Well, and, and you get it again down here also. Is it possible for a character to use a wish spell to become immune to a sonic attack? One wish spell properly worded. Properly worded. <laughs> so. That's, that's kind of awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is it is interesting that they've sort of caught up with you at that point, you know, <laughs> properly worded. Um, we do want to make note that this is one of the first appearances of Ravenloft, uh, which started out simply as a module and later spawned an entire game world and has, has now also spawned a separate board game and, and all sorts of other accoutrements. Um, but note who the creators on Ravenloft were. Oh, yes. The Hickmans. Yep. And so. it's, it. you know, this is, I, I don't know, is this, yeah, I think this is close to the first iteration. This is a lifestyle game. This is one that yeah. the people who love to play in the world that becomes Ravenloft really like to play in Ravenloft. Yes. And, uh, and it had a completely and, different feel than anything else at the time, which, you know, was kind of cool. Um, this is... This is, you know, the the Goths finally have something in D and D they can play with, um, but, but for it was all of still six D&D. bucks. Oh yes, yes, very much so. Um, and that's and that I think was the key, and that's the genius of the Hickmans, um, in my mind, because obviously they're from, you know, I I actually can say I've darkened their table a couple of times over the years at Lake Geneva, and they've always been D and D players. Yeah. And when they imagined Ravenloft, they imagined it as very much a D&D universe. And they didn't become frustrated with it, become frustrated with the rules. They wanted to build it in there. And that's something we don't see enough of. You don't have to create your entirely new rule system, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think one of the best things that Ravenloft did, and the thing that I don't think it gets enough credit for, it gets, it gets a lot of credit for atmospherics. Right, I mean the the feel sure. of Ravenloft is is why it's so correctly extolled among many of the the role playing cognoscenti. Uh, but the thing that I think goes unspoken enough that that we we should call it out as being a big deal. Um, vampires are pretty badass, and this was before you had vampires on you know every pop TV show out there. This was you know years before many of these other vampire stories and novels and books were being written. You know, Dracula was still it. And and this was even probably before, um, you know, Anne, Anne Rice's books had sort of taken over the, the pop culture world some. Um, not that they weren't being written, but, but they, didn't, they didn't have the cultural impact that they have uh, today, certainly, or even 20 years ago. Um, but, but they turned Dracula into a badass. And, and he is he is a very, very powerful, malevolent force over top of all of Ravenloft. And, and while the atmospherics are there, uh, the truth is you don't just sort of wander in with a vial of holy water and a couple of steaks and walk out with a vampire scalp. Um, you're going to get your ass kicked <laughs> if you don't have a good long-term yep. plan to beat the vampire in Ravenloft. Um, th- he's a tough nut to crack by design. He is a big bad on purpose, um, and, and I think that doesn't get enough enough mention, enough love, enough credit. Um, Agree. All right, uh, we're still on sage advice for psionics over here. So, if a fighter gains the discipline of domination and then switches to thief class, as a bard would do, would this character lose the domination? About these almost read like the wordings that you would get for you know Magic the Gathering card rulings. Yeah. Yes. For something that should be as free form as a role playing game can be, we're still rules lawyer in the hell out of this, aren't we? Well, two, you you get the you get the problem of you know deciding deciding what it is that matters and what it is that doesn't matter in the game that you're playing, and it doesn't seem to me that they know. 
Yeah. It doesn't seem to me that they know what's important and what isn't. Because, you know, the, there's the old famous George Carlin sketch about the guy who is, it's Good Friday and he's on a ship at sea. And suddenly the chaplain goes into a coma. And then yeah. you're wanting to receive. But then it's Easter Sunday, too late. But then you cross the international date line. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, if you want to know what the writer intended, fine. But when you're doing this, and, and this is why so many games become afraid of min-maxers. Yeah. Because if you really do perceive it as, I'm fighting the dungeon master and I'm going to beat him, I don't know why you're playing this game in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Because then it's it, it's head-to-head. It's not collaborative. So. Right. And it always should be collaborative. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Um, all right. We're still on Sage Advice. That tells you everything you need to know about what a pain in the ass Sonics were to integrate into a game. Um, so, so here's overhauling the system. So let's try and fix this, right? A three-part remedy for problems with Sonics. Step one, get rid of the existing magic system. So this is, this is about as that, would you believe, endured with a forced grin? <laughs> so the, the, the system can greatly unbalance a campaign. Yeah. You don't say. <laughs> Master of the understatement there, Mr. Schrock. Um, the, uh, all right, we're going to, so, because what we need is a psionic specific class, right? <laughs> um, I will say this. If the psionicist existed as, a, as its own unique class and psionic abilities were stripped out of everywhere else in the game, it might have worked, right? It, it at least had a better chance at working. Um, well, the, but if you take a look at how he eventually deals with this, <clears throat> down on page 23, he says the real secret to it and the real problem with it is they know too much about it. Yeah. And if... If they know too much, they're going to abuse it. Well, that means your system is screwed up. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 you're right. You're right. Um, look, if, if the characters are abusing the powers, it's because you've lost control of the DM. So. Or because the system itself wasn't particularly well thought out. Yes. Yeah, that's and that's. At, I, I will say I will say this. Here's here's a really good example, and he brings it up right above the paragraph that reads conclusion. Under no circumstances may players refer to the defenseless psionic table when a situation requiring it arises. The result of an attack upon a defenseless psionic should always be in doubt until the attack has been made. Every psionic player that I knew, and as I said, my universe was very very small, was consistently arguing. The person they were attacking was defenseless. Yeah, you don't know that. And <laughs> and uh, and you know what? I found it really hard to argue with them because unless I have a, a light that flashes in front of my forehead that says I'm about to attack you psionically, why are you throwing up a defense? Yeah. Yes, there are passive defenses, but they're not going to be nearly significant enough to deal with me if I'm coming at you with a significantly built up attack. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very weird and I think ultimately a broken system. Yeah. Um so we have the psionicist um which you know a, a class that moves on so so again if we're dealing with psionic magic the same way we're dealing with illusionist magic the same way we're dealing with druid magic the same way we're dealing with cleric magic then it makes sense that this this character would exist and then we strip Sonics away from everybody else except for the, the oddball one-off here and there. Um, kind of like the oddball one-off Ranger gets a spell to cast every once in a while kind of thing. Um, then, then I think it works. I think this fixes a lot of those problems. Um, I do want to make note of the fact that, um, check it out, we've actually got a reasonably well laid out chart. We've, we've got a few font screw-ups here and there, like the mismatch sevens here in the middle. They're going to drive somebody like me that used to teach this stuff, you know, kind of nuts. But by and large, compared to what we've seen from comparable contemporary Dragon magazines, this is actually reasonably well laid out. 
So it, it it falls apart over under just it falls apart under disciplines on the right though. It does. It does because they they can't keep their fonts consistent. Um, we've got like four different kinds of fives floating around in here, but but by and large, look at least it's all in a line where you can tell where the numbers belong. Unlike that godforsaken traveler chart we saw a couple of episodes ago, um, you can at least tell where everything belongs. Now it's not quite as clean as we would like, but compared to what we've had up until now, yeah, you know, at least this one's usable. All yeah. right. Stray spaces on the parentheses here are going to get you points docked when you turn this assignment in, but <laughs> but at least I know where all the numbers belong in the columns, unlike that traveler chart, you know, a couple episodes ago. Um, all right, hey, look, a villain's vigilante's ad. Um, I'm, I'm skipping us ahead a little bit on purpose because there was a particular article on here. There we go, the Darnie. You ever read any of the Kurtz books? You sure? Oh yeah. <laughs> so so let's face it. You were asking. You know, look, we we all want to play the characters from our literature. This is them, right? This is this is where psionics come from. And the challenge, of course, is that this is a completely different magic system than Vancey and magic, which, quite frankly, is a completely different magic system than. In the Eddings books, you know, it's different than what was in Tolkien. It's different than what was in whatever, like fill in the blank. They've all got their own different kinds of systems. And if you want to play a Derny campaign, sure. But it means that everybody else's normal, you know, the normal Vancey and D&D magic doesn't exist. And instead, everybody's got psionic powers. I think really yes. that's that's what it comes back to. What's well, say, what say with you? We've certainly mm -hmm. we've talked about this in multiple contexts, but if you if you take magic from another world and put it into the literature of another, you're not always going to get desirable results. No, you yeah. know, and I know that that is why I believe GURPS, yes, GURPS speaks of universes of low, middle, and high magic. Yeah, you know, what sort of a world do you want to work in? Does it have Little or none? Does it have some, or is it crazy? It's, it's available everywhere. And once you make those decisions, that's fine. But expecting a character of a certain type to work, it's sort of like, as I tried to explain to my son years ago, you can't. Wizards aren't going to be particularly good frontline fighters, really, ever. But certainly not through their first ten levels. They're going to get turned into a, a red mist. Yes. And yes. if you take a character like the Dernier and put them into, as you say, a more standard Dungeons & Dragons universe, nobody's going to respect them. Yeah. They're not going to be particularly devastating or impressive. Yeah. Particularly since, you know, at the first four levels, their primary power seems to be, you know, sort of heraldry. You know what I mean? If, if you've read the Kurtz book, <laughs> she, is, she is very fond of very accurately and detailedly describing the heraldry of, of everyone. Um, but, yeah, the uh, I, I think if you're going to have a Darny campaign, you absolutely have Sonics, but you don't have any other kind of magic. I think if you're going to have an Eddings campaign, you have Eddings kind of magic. I think if you're going to have fill-in-the-blank campaign, you're going to have that kind of magic. If you're doing a Norse campaign, you're going to have runic magic. You know, what, whatever whatever it may be. Um, as as necessary, the uh, you know I I've read the Kurtz books. I enjoy it. I haven't read all the Kurtz books. There's like thirty of them, but I've read the original trilogy and I've read at least one of the sequel trilogies, and they're good books. I had fun with them. They're they're absolutely a fantasy world that anyone sitting down reading would go, hey, this is kind of cool. I wouldn't mind playing in this world, but playing in that world was a different world than than the ones that we're used to, than the ones that we normally think of when we start wanting to sit down and, and play a D and D type role playing game. So, um, it, it is a little different. Um, you know, they're fun books. I would absolutely recommend folks that haven't read them. On the off chance that we have anybody under the age of thirty five listening to this, go read the original books from the early seventies. They're great reads. Look, they're fantasy books, so it's not like they're dated. Um, but they're they're great reads. They're a lot of fun, and they're certainly worth checking out. Um, 
and it gives you a solid alternate perspective on how a fantasy world can be created and you know these, these characters can be worked in um, all right here are our heroes and villains so we've statted out our because uh, you know we got to have stats for these guys don't we sure well and, and look we if, if like you say you want to live in this world you want to play in this world show me some balanced characters show me what you think they will look like I'm I'm all with that yeah Oh, Cam Camber ain't balanced at all. Camber just walks around and says, you die, right? I mean, what, what I find interesting, <laughs> as I was flipping through these slightly in preparation for tonight, um, and again, I've read the Kurtz book, so I know who a lot of these characters are. One of the things that really jumped out at me was if, if we go back to our earlier episodes where they had our Babylonian gods statted out, where they had you know our, our elven deities statted out and uh and i'm grabbing camber here camber's more powerful than any of those guys you were talking about pazuzu right he thinks you out of existence camber of Coley does that to you like in actual game terms he can do that to you which is something that other previously statted out critters we've read couldn't do so that's fair that's fair um so yeah, here are various heroes and villains. Um, we're going to come back to the Citadel by the Sea design contest because I want to get ahead a little bit while we're still talking psionics. Uh, there's our figure future. Come on, there we go. The Ecology of the Mind Flayer. Well, you know. This is, this is relevant, though. Uh, where'd we go? Greetings and welcome. We send messengers into the astral plane asking uh, for those who would, for a price, tell us about a race known as Mind Flayers. Don't play with me. You and your guests are playing to raid a Mind Flayer lair you've heard a rumor of. You're desperate to know more about the creature beforehand. Right? There's our Githyanki speaking in here. Mind Flayers are not of your world. They are not of any known world. They have been traveling the plains for so long, not even they know where they come from. This was the inspiration for all of the Mind Flayer descriptions that they use in the second season of Stranger Things. Aha. Uh -huh. That's why it was familiar. This is where that comes hey, from. Hey, hey, spoilers. Spoilers. The fact that they describe the dude as a mind... Okay, so first of all, we, we joked about at what point do the spoilers expire... Okay, I, I think I think we're still in a spoiler window for second season. Are we? It's been over a month. I'm saying. Okay. I realize most normal people digested their second season in a couple days, but well, so in in my defense, we haven't given away a single plot point at all. We've That's simply true. all true. we've simply said is here is where one of the descriptors that the kids use comes from, and the fact that. Those kids are D&D &D players in the mid-80s. Really isn't sneaking up on anybody that knows a damn thing about Stranger Things, right? <laughs> I haven't spoiled anything that you didn't see in the in the trailer at this point. Um, well, that's true. But well, yeah. if paid any, well, if you had any concept at all, what it is. So, uh, of interest, um, the second season of Stranger Things starts on uh, basically Halloween weekend of 1984. And this is October 83 issue, so this one's been out for a year. So the kids certainly would have had some time to digest this and have worked this into their stories by the time the, uh, the, the events take place in the second season of Stranger Things. And again, I'm not giving away anything. Like, the first scene of episode one of season two starts off with the title card, Halloween 1984. So I'm not giving away a thing here. <laughs> um... But yeah, that's, that's you know, when they're describing where the Mind Flayers, you know, why they've called this thing the Mind Flayer and where they think it comes from, this is this is the descriptor that they're using almost verbatim. And, uh, and this was the first canonical place, if you want to consider Dragon Magazine to be canonical, um, where this is mentioned, where, where the, the background of the Illithid comes from. Um, this, this isn't even brought up in the original hardcover presentation for the Mind Flayer. Um, so this is where we first hear about it. 
Um, but again, mind flayers were always kind of a bit of a badass in the game, but they required you to put psionics into your game to really make them effective badasses. And at that point, what have you done to the rest of your game? <laughs> if that's the well, only psionic creature out there, now what? Well, the two we run run into the most, right? Mind flayers and, and thought eaters. Yeah. And both of them, frankly, you ran as spells. Yeah. Yeah. True. You you you, you figured out their magic. You know, you you just didn't. With again, the one exception. My, the guy that I want that I had that wanted to have psionic powers. One of the things he wanted to do was go hunting, uh, not mind flayers, but thought eaters. Yeah. And mm -hmm. he would try. He actually tried to devise traps for them, and tried to figure out ways to immobilize them, carry on conversations with them, all these other things. But when you're role playing them as a practical mm -hmm. matter, you're not going to take apart your magic system just to make this one character work the way it's intended. You'll take that round peg, stick it in a square hole, and hit that some bitch as hard as you can. Yeah. Well, and, and I think, you, you know, you nailed it in that you will convert this to some alternate magic effect such that you, as best as possible, maintain the feel of what this thing is supposed to be while fitting it within the constraints of, of the rules you're trying to play. Which, gee... We just discussed a really solid idea where you made that happen. <laughs> you, you took an existing something out there and found a way to put it into the game context that you're playing so that the feel gets maintained. It's exactly what they did with Ravenloft. Let's do the same thing with the Mind Flayers. Let's do the same thing with our Thought Eaters. Let's do the same thing with whatever. Um, but yeah, the reason I grabbed this issue was... Um, what was specifically the, the illithids, the ecology of the mind flare. I'm giving everybody an epileptic fit as fast as I'm flipping through these pages here. Um, but yeah, this is, this is where the text that they used from Stranger Things comes from. This is what this is based on. Um, of note, this was one of the issues that I had bought off the newsstand way back when. So I had this one back when my Dragon Magazine collection was about 14 issues. And I had read this one quite a lot. And so I... I knew about where to find uh, the text that they were talking about from Stranger Things. You know, as they're reading, I'm going, hey, wait a minute, I know where that comes from. Um, my wife, of course, thinks I'm nuts, you know, as I'm muttering at the TV. Um, but yeah, that's that's where this this came out of uh, for, for our Mind Flare. Um, also, interestingly, this is one of the better written and more readable articles about the ecology of the fill-in-the-blank. Um you know, many of them read like a biology textbook. This one's actually like a short story that is fairly engaging. So, um, all right, I promised we would back up and discuss Citadel by the Sea. Um, again, this is a module design contest back when they ran such things. Um, Low-level critter, uh, very generic location. You can graph this into any campaign you've got out there. And, uh, and so what are we trying to do? Um, you know, should be well equipped with at least one magical weapon apiece, but do not need an, any particular game experience. You need a ranger, you need an elf, and no half works. There you go, Jim. No, uh, no parent, no parental issues going on there. So, thing, nothing I have to unsee. Yes, um, but but this is sort of a solve the magical curse. We've got a plague out there. Something's going wrong. Uh, let's go try and, and save the town kind of adventure. Um, honestly, this is this is a good adventure in that it gives low-level heroes a chance to be the heroes. Um, it's, it's an appropriately scaled challenge for them. Um, but what it does is it gives low-level guys to, to get a chance to go be heroic and, and actually be heroic and, uh, and kind of, you know, save the town where it's an exertion for the lower level guys that are just stepping up to be tough guys. Um, it's, uh, you know, look, four, you know, 14th level characters wouldn't even blink it in a little adventure like this. Um, but I like playing the low level stuff. This was, this was a good bit of fun. Um, also of note, decent artwork. The, the artwork is certainly improving beyond pen and ink sketches from our, you know, eighth grade math notebooks. Um, nice little layout. 
slightly weathered look on the map. You notice the, the absence of perfectly clear grid lines in here. Um, I don't know because I didn't bother to look up the artist, but I'd be willing to guess that the artists that worked on this are the same ones that worked on Module X3, Curse of Xanathon. Um, go look it up because the artwork looks remarkably similar to the same kind of artwork that it exists in X3. Uh, definitely worth a good little read. So, uh, just wanted to throw that out there. Hey, look, a PBM game. <laughs> we're gonna Internet beat that drum to death you. man <laughs> um our figure feature we're still doing white on black aren't we well because you know color photography had not yet been invented yeah <laughs> um well it had not been yet been affordable for dragon magazine <laughs> um fair enough Sci-fi and gaming convention calendar. Notice it's not just game conventions. It's also sci-fi conventions. So, the world fantasy convention. There's, there's a Dragon Con, which I find interesting because when everybody thinks of Dragon Con, they're thinking of Atlanta, right? They're not thinking of Portland, Maine. Right. Um, here's Gen Con South in March down Jacksonville, Florida. I find it interesting that Pirate Con takes place in Amarillo, Texas, a place renowned for its pirate infestations. <laughs> oh my goodness. They're uh Panhandle of Texas there. Word. And uh Rock Con. Rock Con October 22nd to 23rd. Uh it's under a different name now. They've merged, but that is still an ongoing con. Rock Con still happening, huh? So let's hear it for that. I, I will say, StellarCon bounced around quite a bit, and and I believe was still going when I was in school here in North Carolina the first time. Um, I say in school the first time. The first time I lived in North Carolina and was back in, in college then in the early 90s. I, I want to say StellarCon was still hanging on at the time. Um, I don't think it still is. Um, but, but there you go. Um I do like Onocon. Onocon! So, decent guest list there. Frederick Pohl, El Sprague de Camp. That's, that's not a bad crowd. Um, all right. Only those that pass the Chi Square test can play. Come on, seriously? We're well, going to do stats? <laughs> um, for the record, I had a very similar program to this in my Tandy Radio Shack 80. Okay then. The, uh, the, this is this this is. Uh, I was using it for other purposes, but I do find it fascinating that there uh, that the the notion is: Are you worried that your dice are fair? And if not, and they are game science dice with the warranty, you can return them for well, new yeah, dice. Well, right. You're, no, 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 no. You're. I believe that if I ran this test up against my game science warranty D10. That uh, I would be allowed to send it to Luzachi and demand a full refund, or at a minimum, a replacement. Yes, I think you would get a replacement. I don't know that you would get a refund. Right. Um, and there it is, the basic program to calculate chi, chi square. The the great thing about this, like, oh yeah, all of these stats tests are all like the very first ones you learn in a grad school stats class of sort of how to calculate your basic stats needed in the social sciences. Like if you're in an education school, in grad school, and you're learning how to do, you know, in your, in your introduction to statistical methods class, this is what you learn in like the first six weeks. Not how to program it, but how to take somebody else's existing program and make it work. Um, but let's also marvel at the fact that you had a basic program, and you notice they don't tell you what kind of computer you got to plug this into. This would have worked on a VIC-20, this would have worked on an Atari 400 running basic. Any, you know, you could have done this on a Commodore PET. Yes, kids, those were all the names of computers. <laughs> Here's our Mind Flayer again. I above the uh, ecology of the Mind Flayer. Yes. I never saw these minis from Fasa. This is 
drawing a complete blank with me. The Wrath of Khan minis? These, th yeah, these one 3,900th scale starships. I, I'd have bought the hell out of these. Huh. You could have gotten some box sets that included a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, I, I just, I, I played a, a I played a metric ton of uh, Starfleet Battles in the day, but I always hated playing it with the Jets. Yeah. Because it was never sufficiently evocative. So the fact that I've got this right, that I could have had this, this is, this is nice. This is very cool. Huh. Never saw those. Um, so the Castle Creations uh, Christmas sale of these superhero minis. So first of all, these are not particularly good looking minis drawings here. But I will say one of the things that we did a whole lot back in 6th and 7th grades, we got out the tracing paper and these particular minis from this specific ad and we would trace the general outlines of them and then we'd start marking them up and changing them and tweaking them and doing whatever the hell we wanted to to them that uh, my my 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth grade D&D uh, &D notebooks were full of character portraits based off of pencil sketches of this ad. So, well, and you know, hey, that's some that's some good stuff right there. Lots of modifications of this girl right here because with the staff that turns into an axe, that turns into a magician's staff, that turns into all kinds of things. Um, this dude right here with the cape and the sword that got modified about fourteen different ways. This guy became a duelist, which appeared like five issues before this. Um, you know, we we covered that issue on the on a previous episode. Uh, we used the hell out of the, these speci this specific ad um, to uh, to create a whole lot of character portraits because uh, they're they're solid simple outlines. They don't need to be anything overly fancy. They're very easy to modify, and they worked well for us. Um, how much you want to bet? Hover tank here was heavily inspired by Hammer Slammers, but go. I have hover tank. Go to the physical components. Four 11 by 17 back printed three color geomorphic maps for a total of eight. That's maps. cool. Got it. 16 page it. rule book. Probably Keep underwritten going. like most rule books of the day were. Two combat yeah. charts and table sheets, one die, one pad of plotting sheets, two Stop back right printed there. counter sheets. A, a pad of store. what? Plotting sheets? Plotting sheets. So you had to write your own operations orders as a part of this. Yep. Love it. I want you I know you do. <laughs> I know you do. But but the fact is when you stuck that into my uh 17 year old head I was not ready for this. <laughs> the brain exploded, I was, huh? Yeah, I was like I got to do what? No, I want to just I I'm playing ogre by this time. I'm playing Hell Tank by this time. Yeah. Just move the tank, give me an odds ratio, I'm rolling a die. What do you mean I'm plotting? Yeah, yeah. Good luck with that. <laughs> and uh, and let's also note that this predates TCS by some number of years, and I believe probably predates Ranger by at least a couple of years. Yes. Um, so, so the idea that you're having to plan this stuff. Now, it does not predate the Avalon Hill Starship Troopers game, that had a variety of mission plotting right. sheets necessary, um, but well, yeah, but th those plots were for the those were for the bugs. Yes, to mark up their underground tunnels. Yes, but you still had to have them designated plot. for the uh, for the mobile infantry to to go identify them. So there yes. there was some planning that necessary. Um, yes, but yeah, that's that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. I never played Hover Tank. I, I'm not sure I ever actually saw it physically in person anywhere. So, um, all right. So here is the solution to all of your psionic problems. Spells can be psionic too. How and why magic resembles mental powers. Let's uh, let's simply make a note of the uh, that that famous conversation from way back when that. You know, any sufficiently advanced technology will appear indistinguishable from magic to those, uh, you know, yes. without the know-how. So, you know. Uh, exactly what are spells resembling psionic powers? Well, okay, that's magic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, we had a perfectly good system for that. No offense. Yeah, he called it magic. Um, but, you know, look, I, I get the point here. Somebody's got a Journey character that they go, hey, this is kind of cool. I would love to use... I, I want to play this kind of dude in a D&D game. How do I make that happen? And, and you know, if it doesn't easily enough translate into what we've already got set for an existing magic system, what do we graft onto it? Um, I'm not a big fan but of grafting. I think it's a replacement. But isn't that ultimately what I was talking about in the context of wanting to take on a a mind flayer and not necessarily want to upend the rest of your gaming system. Yeah, your exactly. Game night. Yeah. You know, just, just work it out. Yeah. And, and that seems to be in fairness, basically what the uh, author here is saying, figure out those spells that kind of look like psionics or more importantly, those psionic powers that kind of look like spells and make it work. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be fine. All is well. Absolutely. Hey, look, Fantasy Games Unlimited ad. <laughs> I think we had a couple back up here a little bit, too, didn't we? Hey, look, Fantasy Games Unlimited nope. ads. We, we did. We just hadn't mentioned them in a while. I mean, they're everywhere. They're sort of background noise, but, you know, we just hadn't mentioned them in a while. Um, but again, okay, so Layout Geek Alert. We, we start up here at the top with Kim Mohan's byline, and then it is, it is a Pratian wall of text. For the next four, five, six pages here. Um, yep. Again, give me a pull quote, guys. Give me some big headers. Give me some guideposts. Help guide me through this article so that I have something to skim. All right, we'll come back to Top Secret here in a second. Let's just take a moment and note. In Dragon Magazine, we have an ad for your SPI specialists. Yep. We love that it. Is, that is quite something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Here you go, Jim. Top secret. Do it to it. It it's it is interesting, and this is this by the way, is I think the greatest problem to ever confront um modern sci fi really any kind of modern gaming. How do you interact the melee or even the combat with vehicles? Yeah. Nobody solves this problem. Uh, no, at least not to my satisfaction, because they're two different things. The the early age attempt very much represented here, and they say it. We're going to take the one turn is five seconds approach. Yeah. And that's fine. And, and the, the problem is really pretty basic. Unless you're drawing it out on a map, human beings and vehicles move so radically differently from each other. It's sort of a piece of the problem that you're certainly familiar with of dealing with fully automatic weapons in a yeah. role-playing or a combat sim. You know, we are all familiar with Twilight 2000 and its original attempts to literally track every bullet and every gun. And when you do that, you get these disconnects between the action that we're all familiar with in a role-playing game, man-to-man -man combat, yeah. and suddenly you've got this car rolling by you and it's, I remember I set up a couple of 8x4s years ago, and I took out a 164th scale, that's your matchbox scale car, and I just tried to do an auto duel on that table. And it is amazing <laughs> at that scale how far a car can move. We don't realize until you see it how fast 80 miles per hour is. Oh, yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Which is, which is why you've got... The, the famous rolling boards, you know, the boards that you pick up, everybody gets to one end and you move them to the back and start over. You get uh, systems that abstractly track them, or you get systems that just pitch it out the window entirely and deal with it in the form of an abstraction. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, and this seems to be very much where this is at, but even so, well, here it is. Uh, they've, they've got the table right here. The vehicle is moving 50 mi 55. It's doing the double nickel. It's doing... 385 feet every five seconds. Yeah. Well, if your scale is, let's say, 25 millimeters, which is six feet the inch, do a little bit of math. Yeah. You know, you, you, you just cross the dining room. You know? <laughs> right. Where, where are you going to play this? So it's, 
And that is why some games like Savage Worlds and those that have come along later have said, look, oh my God, do you see who this is? Yeah. I just noticed this. Oh, Tex? Yeah. Yeah. So he, this is a guy that knows a fair amount about role-playing games. Yes. And knows a fair amount about uh, tabletop wargaming. Still does. Yeah. And, and um, he's, he's played with this. That's fascinating to me now. That, uh, that has jumped up at me. This is absolutely an, an ongoing problem, this, this disconnect between the two scale systems. Uh, but ultimately, it kind of goes back to talking about psionics and magic. Yeah. If you want to play Car Wars or a game like Car Wars where there are car chases and cool stuff, in any kind of satisfying detail, go play those games. They exist. If, on the other hand, you want to play a role-playing game where suddenly there's a moment you're like, and the DM says to you, oh my gosh, you suddenly have to make a sharp 45 degree turn. Roll a D6. Well, what's my car? What's my skill? Stop that. You're going to yeah. drive yourself nuts. Yeah. Well, and I think I think there's, there's two things that have developed certainly to a greater degree since these articles were being written that, that absolutely make a difference in the way that we deal with these kinds of things. The first one, and I actually have a deck of them here somewhere, um, Pathfinder developed all these different decks of cards that, that you can use for various things going on in a game. One of them are the chase cards. You know, there is a foot pursuit now going through the, the, the slums of the Thieves' Quarter, and what's happening is you flip a card over every so often during the, the chase. Hey, you just ran into a close, like a literal clothesline, not some dude sticking his arm out there trying to tackle you, but like an actual clothesline. Hey, there's a stray dog that just runs across through whatever. Suddenly there's there's a tight turn through an alleyway or whatever. Um, you know, the, the ability to sort of semi-randomly uh, inject something into that car chase I think makes a difference. But the other thing is we're, we're still, and it, it's not just because it's text writing this, we're still certainly seeing the wargaming roots of role-playing right here in that we are we are quantifying everything with exact numbers. Right, some of these things are kind of rounded off to the nearest fives and nearest tens, but over here, this this bash column one, two, three, four, eight, ten. I mean, we're getting very specific in the numbering, instead of simply going with short, medium, long, high, medium, low. Um, let's let's group these things into broader categories, and let's not have to crunch every single number. If we're gonna have a car chase, are we moving at low speed, medium speed, high speed? Are we moving around a sharp corner or or a moderate corner or hey we're just sort of changing lanes, you know? And and sure. let's let's not have to slap a number on everything. Let's put some general purpose categories out there and let's interact at that point. We're at you know medium range but at high speed. Well, that's okay. So you need a twelve to hit or whatever it might be. We're at high speed, but we're at very low range. We're side by side doing 80 miles an hour. Well, there's a pretty good chance I'm going to hit somebody from four feet away that's the size of a car. It doesn't matter how fast the car is going. And, and so the ability to abstract things and the, the acceptance of those abstractions by the players, I think, has definitely changed over the years. But if you are Ed, and now he's doing, of course, two-hour war games, which I've played just a ton of, yeah. If you are Ed and this is what you're doing, he he has made the choice. He says, look, you want to play a role-playing game or do you want to play a war game? He obviously wanted to play both. Yeah. And what he what he chose to <laughs> do... Let's be fair, do, Dave Arneson did what he too. Chooses to, <laughs> yeah, it would, what he chose to do in his reaction system is to create a game system that you can play in... that you can literally play solo or, as I've done many times cooperatively against the system. Yeah. But they're not role-playing games. Yeah, yeah. It, it, they are, they are, I, I play them, that's, it's my preferred colonial system these days, his colonial adventure system, which is very, very good. Um, but this, this here is, he's, he's trying to fit again that square peg into a round hole. Yeah, yeah. And I think it would take us a few, as you say, I think, it took us a few more years to figure out you know, to to in the immortal words of the song, let it go. Yeah, or or let's 
instead of forcing the peg into the hole, let's change the hole. Sure. So and, and let's or let's evaluate what we're hitting in the first place. Yeah, I I will tell you that. Um, several different times I've had people say, you know, yeah, we can do car chases with this game. And and the first thing I always tell them is, all right, guys, here's what we're gonna do. I want you to pull up the middle 30 minutes of the movie Ronin. And I want you to recreate that car chase in your game. Oh, that's great. And if you oh, can't, great. then don't come back to me and tell me you figured out how to do car chases in a game. All right, if you can't make that happen, because you've got you've got collisions, you've got RPGs, <laughs> you've you've got hard corner turns, you've got guys, you know, having to weave through traffic on cliffs. You've got in town, out of town. You've got guys hitting folks from oblique angles. You got folks running over fruit vendors. If you can't recreate that car chase in your game system, back to the drawing board with you. Yes. So, um, all right, we're we're over an hour here. We gotta we gotta move on a little. Um, interestingly, <clears throat> um, role play. We've got a magazine ad inside a competing magazine. And of note, every year at Origins, the National Adventure Gaming Convention, the H.G. Wells Award is given to the magazine Gamers Feel, is the best in the role-playing field. At Origins 83, Space Gamer won that award. And now it's been... I, I subscribed to Space Gamer and never read an episode of Fantasy Gamer. Yeah. Well, I've got a handful of the old Steve Jackson's combined ones. I also have most of the ones when Better Games out of Southern California uh, got got a hold of the the license for the the name, and they they managed to spit out twelve or fourteen or so issues of Space Gamer Fantasy Gamer. Um, every issue included a complete role playing game, some of which were a ton of fun, some of which were had had good parts worth rating, but were not necessarily a great game overall. Um, but I, I do find it interesting. Couple of pieces here uh, at Origins, the National Adventure Gaming Convention. Um, no mention of it being the Avalon Hill House Convention. This is the National right. Adventure Gaming Convention, the H.G. Wells Award. I'm curious at what point we quit calling it the H.G. Wells Award. I would be dying to know that. Um, that that would be of great interest to me. I'm curious where the Origins Awards interacted with the Strategy Gamer Club Awards, whatever it was, way back at the beginning of the magazine there. What was this? The Strategist Club Awards. How did the Origins Awards interact with those? Um, and how did either of them interact with the Charlies? Um, but but that's, that's an interesting little curiosity that I noted. Not just that we have... Somebody else trumpeting being the best role-playing magazine in another role-playing magazine, <laughs> right? And Dragon took this ad. I mean, they saw themselves as the flagship magazine for the entire hobby, and they took this ad. It would be cool to have that kind of magazine again. I'm not going to run it. I would subscribe to it, but I'm not going to run it. <laughs> <laughs> I heard enough cats already with you guys. Um, all right, the Dragon Quest rules for finding fresh food. Because what Dragon Quest needed was more rules. I, I was going to say, as if that was somehow the deficiency. Yeah. <laughs> the last thing Dragon Quest needed was rules. Good Lord. Um, I, the way in which Dragon Quest managed to look like the playable role-playing game was the fact that it was created roughly at the same time and sold by the same company as Universe. Were it not for the Universe role-playing game, Dragon Quest would look completely unplayable. Um, Alright, there's a Nexus ad for Task Force games. How much Task Force stuff you got? <laughs> uh, with respect to Starfleet Battles, I'm going to say... Only a fool says all of it, but I think I'm pretty close. Let, let me ask. How much Task Force stuff do you own that is not Starfleet Battles? Oh. 
<laughs> Do I have anything? <laughs> Suddenly put to... you on the spot there. <laughs> That's, uh, uh, I'm <laughs> sure I have some Nexus magazines. <laughs> Which, which were they essentially did, they did, bought for the Starfleet here, Battles content. They did no, but they also did historical gaming. Yeah. Um, because they always had, you know, because in Nexus, they always had SSDs. Yeah. Which were the holy grail for all of us Starfleet Battles guys. Yeah. Um, but I'm pretty sure I have some of the Nexuses that have historical stuff. But that, yeah, that probably would be it. All right, the classified ads of the gaming world. Very important one on the second page. On the second page, on the second spread, or on the second, on the right-hand oh, side of this yeah, one? Yeah, I'm looking at it a little differently than you are. Uh, right side there, right side, middle column at the top. The fair shake, the dice tower. It's called a, it's a no, it is not a dice tower. It's a dice device. It's a dice device. Yeah. <laughs> I think... This may predate the coinage of the term dice tower. You may be correct. That's that's. This, no, this, I love the fact that the dice device shakes, rattles, and rolls your dice into a handy fifteen square inch display area for quick, unquestionable readings and game speed up. Yep. Yep. No nuclear so cats. Yeah. That's so delightful. And, and and so here's here's something that I will note. Only twelve ninety five plus two dollars shipping and handling. So it was essentially it was fourteen ninety five. Right. The dice tower that I have here in my up in the game den, um, I picked up at uh at, at a Buckeye Game Fest back when I lived in Columbus and I went to one of the cabs Buckeye Game Fests. Um, I actually ended up using a little bit of, of credit because I worked the registration desk for an afternoon and got got you know five bucks worth of credit for the vendors that were there, um, which was all of like three dudes, um, but one of which was Ron Charity Hobbies and Ron had dice towers for sale and I paid fifteen bucks for my dice tower. Now was it is it accurate to describe your dice device as where did it go now rich walnut decorator finish? Uh, actually, it, it is a fairly rich walnut finish. And, wow. And if you remind me towards the end of this week when I get ready to post this episode, I will take a picture of it and append it to the article. Uh, um, I demand that we see the rugged, handcrafted wood construction. You know, whether it is rugged construction or not, I will say this, it has survived multiple trips to and from Origins uh, <laughs> and, and still rolls dice okay. I do not know if it was handcrafted. However, I don't know of any assembly lines making dice towers either. So I'm going to work on the assumption that it probably was. So. Okay. I can't imagine anybody set up a factory assembly line for dice towers. Or dice devices, as the case may be. I understand. But but that is one thing where the price has not significantly changed in 30-odd years. Still paid fifteen bucks so. for a dice tower. Um. Okay, so of course there are our answers for what's coming up here on uh, Hey Gang. So with our uh, our logic problems for uh, for what's new, helping you hone your gaming skills. Well, here's your chance to prove it. Logic problem number one. You, an 18th level chaotic evil fighter, and your companions, a lawful evil halfling and a neutral gnome, have just scored 11 chests, each containing 157 gold pieces. How do you split them? You are not asking me these. <laughs> are you trying to do the math? Or do you want the answer from earlier in the magazine? Because the... The answer from earlier in the magazine is actually quite hilarious. Um, it, it's essentially you can uh, you can split the halfling with the bastard sword. However, the gnome's a little tougher, and you need to use your axe. Outstanding. So <laughs> that's how you split them. Um, all right, so we'll move on. Uh, there's Wormy. There is Snarf Quest. Larry Elmore, our contributing artist in Snarf Quest. Um, 
which runs several pages here. Um, and a Harn ad. Um, of note, the King of the Tabletop rules and questions. One of these days, we're going to cover King of the Tabletop. Because it is, I firmly believe, one of, if not the best, Tom Wham game ever to appear in Dragon Magazine. All right. And quite frankly, King of the Tabletop is what is responsible for me being the, the 4X gamer that I am today. That is the game that turned me into a 4X gamer. Wow. So one of these days All we'll right. get to it. So I've written about it in the past on, on the website. Um, it has appeared in a Tracer Rounds column at Grogheads. Um, and, uh, and we've got the Fellowship of the Ring fantasy board game on the back cover. And thus wrappeth Dragon number 78. There you have it. My goodness. Well, we didn't quite make it under an hour, but we weren't too bad. We weren't too bad. Uh, not a lot of excess story time, which kind of helped keep the time down. Um, it did. But, but a bit to cover. I mean, when you're talking about psionics, there's there's a lot to unpack there. Um, yeah. But it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. And it, it's a great topic. It really is. Because it's one of these big chunks of classic Dungeons & Dragons that I dare say never clicked with most people, but I'd be interesting to he interested to hear if anybody had a different impression. Yeah, and and I think you know we rightly noted this comes back to somebody read something cool in a book and wanted to figure out how to play it in a game, and tried to remain as true to the book as possible. Um, but it 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 really it changed the game in ways that I'm not sure the game was able to accurately support. Yes. So, um, all right, cool. Hey, uh, for the next one, why don't you dig up an issue and, and you right. throw an issue out Bye there. Mark. We've probably got maybe two or three more of these before we're going to call a, an end to this for the year and then, uh, let everybody catch their breath for a week or two before the grogcast comes back. Um, but, uh, I say that again, we don't necessarily release these in the order that we've recorded them. So by the time somebody gets around to watching this, um, you know, it, it may be several episodes later, but um, dig up a number. Let's see what we come up with. Will do. All right. And then one of these nights, we'll just have your son pull a number out of the air, and we'll just grab that magazine without any prep whatsoever. Give him a, dis give him a, give him a range and have him go? Yeah. Yeah, why not? Sounds like a deal. All right. Uh, let's stop our recording and...